You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. In 1789, the United States began a new chapter with the implementation of the U.S. federal government following the approval of the Constitution. Before this, the country's early government, under the Articles of Confederation, struggled financially. It couldn't tax citizens directly and had to borrow money to cover costs and pay for the Revolutionary War, ending up $54 million in debt. State governments, on their part, owed another $25 million. Enter Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury. He saw an opportunity to turn this massive debt into a force for good. In his report on public credit, Hamilton proposed a plan to Congress. He suggested combining all the state and national debts into one big debt that the federal government would be responsible for. His idea was a hit, and in the middle of 1790, Congress gave it the green light. But to make this work, the government needed money, specifically, to pay back the people and entities that originally loaned it. By the end of 1790, Hamilton realized that they had maxed out how much they could realistically make from import taxes, which were the government's main source of income. His solution? Introduce an excise tax on American-made spirits, like whiskey. This marked the first time the federal government taxed a product made within the country. This tax hit farmers particularly hard, especially those living far from the eastern cities. The further they were, the more it cost them to get their goods to market, and this new tax on whiskey reduced their profits even more. Despite taxes being generally unpopular, Hamilton argued that taxing whiskey was the least likely to upset people, considering it as a luxury or sin tax. Some even thought it could lessen alcohol consumption by making people more aware of its negative effects. This whiskey tax, or the Whiskey Act, became official in March 1791, with George Washington establishing the specifics like revenue districts and setting up the system to enforce this new tax. Back in 1790, Western Pennsylvania had a population of about 17,000. Among them, many farmers found themselves at odds with a new whiskey tax. Here's the thing. Whiskey wasn't just a popular beverage. It was also a vital part of the local economy. Farmers in the region would turn their extra grain into whiskey, as it was easier and more cost-effective to transport across the Appalachian Mountains than bulky grain. But then came this tax, which those living on the frontier felt unfairly singled them out. You see, dealing in whiskey was also a way to make ends meet, especially since cash and we're talking gold and silver coins here, was hard to come by. In fact, whiskey sort of became a currency in its own right, particularly for the less wealthy who might get paid in it. This tax then hit them like an income tax that their wealthier counterparts in the East didn't face. Small-time farmers were especially vocal, arguing that Alexander Hamilton's tax policy favoured large distilleries, mainly located in the East, due to the tax structure allowing them to pay less tax per gallon the more they produced. Basically. The tax setup meant the big guys could pay a single fee for their operations, while the little guys, running smaller operations, couldn't produce enough to make that worthwhile. They ended up paying more per gallon, and given that whiskey sold for less out west, this took a bigger chunk out of their earnings. Adding to their woes, many of the farmers weren't well educated, leaving them fearful of being duped by corrupt tax collectors. Some believed that Hamilton had it out for them, wanting to squash the small distillers in favour of big business though historians are divided on whether this was actually his intent. Apart from the tax mechanics, there were also issues with how the law was enforced. Distilleries had to be registered, and anyone caught evading the tax had to travel all the way to Philadelphia for court, not an easy journey from Pittsburgh, some 300 miles away. As you might guess, the government didn't have much luck getting this tax off the ground in these areas. Many distillers simply refused to pay, and federal officers tasked with collecting the tax often faced threats or violence. But it wasn't just about the whiskey tax. The folks in western Pennsylvania felt neglected by the national government on several fronts. For starters, the ongoing Northwest Indian War was taking a heavy toll. Then there was Spain's control over the Mississippi River, which blocked key trade routes. The whiskey tax just added fuel to the fire, ramping up the already existing tensions on the frontier. Many folks living on the western edge of the country were really not happy with the new whiskey tax and tried everything to stop it from becoming law. When that did not work, some people in western Pennsylvania got together in unofficial meetings to try and get the law thrown out. They were really focused in four counties, Allegheny, Fayette, Washington and Westmoreland. The first big meeting was on July 27, 1791, at a place called Redstone Old Fort in Fayette County, where they decided to send delegates to another meeting in Pittsburgh in September. This Pittsburgh meeting was more about keeping things calm, led by a level-headed guy named Hugh Henry Brackenridge. 
They even sent a formal complaint to the people who make laws in Pennsylvania and the U.S. House of Representatives in Philadelphia, hoping to get some changes. And it worked, sort of, because they did manage to get the tax lowered a bit in May 1792, thanks to William Findlay, a congressman, but many people were still not happy. Despite calls for peaceful protests, things got violent. A taxman named Robert Johnson got a very rough welcome in September 1791, and it was not just him. Others faced similar fates. Because of all this, they could not even collect the tax in 1791 and early 1792. The people causing trouble were drawing inspiration from the American Revolution, but supporters of the tax saw it differently, arguing that this was a tax approved by their own representatives, not an imposed one without any say. Turns out, it was not just Pennsylvania that disliked this whiskey tax. It was a common feeling across many western areas in Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia and Kentucky. No one in Kentucky would enforce it. In 1792, there was talk of using the military to deal with resistance in western North Carolina, but they decided there was not enough evidence to go that route. In August 1792, a second, more heated meeting took place in Pittsburgh. Key moderates did not show up, but Albert Gallatin did, something he would later regret. A group called the Mingo Creek Association took charge, raising liberty poles and taking over local militia, basically creating their own rules. This got the attention of the federal government, with Alexander Hamilton and the administration seeing it as a major challenge. President Washington even made a proclamation against it in September 1792, after a report by tax official George Clymer made things seem pretty bad. John Neville, a big-time politician and distiller who decided to enforce the tax, faced a lot of pushback, even getting kicked out of his office. People cooperating with tax officials were threatened too, sometimes with violence against their property. Resistance kept up into 1793, with Neville being publicly burned in effigy and another tax man, Benjamin Wells, forced at gunpoint to quit. President Washington even offered a reward for catching those behind these actions, but it did not lead to arrests. In another incident in Morgantown, Virginia, in 1794, a tax collector faced a siege at his home, showing just how widespread and serious the opposition was. This worried local authorities, fearing the unrest might spread even further. In 1794, the conflict over a new tax on whiskey reached its peak. That May, William Rawl, the federal district attorney, sent out legal notices to more than 60 Pennsylvania distillers who hadn't paid this excise tax. The law at the time required these distillers to go all the way to Philadelphia for their court dates. For farmers living in the remote western areas, this trip was prohibitively expensive and difficult. Due to pressure from William Findlay, a lawmaker, Congress changed the law on June 5, 1794, so that these cases could be heard in local courts instead. However, by the time this change was made, U.S. Marshal David Lennox had already started to hand out these notices. William Bradford, the Attorney General, later said the goal was to get people to follow the law, not necessarily to bring them to Philadelphia for trial. This timing led to much debate. Findley, who was not a fan of Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, claimed in his book that Hamilton had timed the notices to spark an uprising right before the law was changed to ease the burden on distillers. Historian Jacob Cook, in 1963, dismissed this idea as preposterous, seeing it as an exaggerated view of Hamilton's power. In 1986, historian Thomas Slaughter suggested that the insurrection might have been caused by a series of unfortunate coincidences, leaving motives up for debate. In 2006, William Hoagland, a critic of Hamilton, argued that Hamilton and his allies wanted to provoke violence to justify using military force to quash the revolt. He pointed out that since the Newburgh crisis in 1783, Hamilton saw using the army to put down tax resistance as a strategy. Historian S. E. Morrison viewed Hamilton's enforcement of the tax more as a way to impose order than to raise money. Federal Marshal Lennox typically encountered little trouble while delivering legal documents. However, things took a dramatic turn on July 15th when General Neville, volunteering to guide Lennox in Allegheny County, accompanied him. That evening, as they approached the Miller Farm, not far from Pittsburgh, they were met with warning shots. Neville managed to make his way home while Lennox fell back to Pittsburgh for safety. The situation escalated on July 16th when a group of at least 30 Mingo Creek militiamen encircled Neville's strongly defended residence, Bower Hill, demanding the marshal's surrender, mistakenly thinking he was inside. Neville's response was a gunshot that fatally injured Oliver Miller, one of the attackers. Despite their attempt to take the house, Neville, with the aid of his slaves, kept them at bay, forcing the militants to retreat and regroup. By the following day, the number of insurgents had ballooned to nearly 600 under the leadership of Major James McFarlane, a seasoned Revolutionary War veteran. Meanwhile, 
Neville had bolstered his defense with ten United States Army soldiers from Pittsburgh, led by his brother-in-law, Major Abraham Kirkpatrick. Before the attackers arrived, Kirkpatrick prudently had Neville hide in a nearby ravine. David Lennox and Neville's son, Presley Neville, also re-entered the area, but ended up captured by the insurgents. The two sides tried to negotiate to no avail. Eventually, the women and children were allowed to exit the house before a fierce gunfight broke out. About an hour in, McFarlane attempted to halt the firefight. A ceasefire appeared imminent when, tragically, McFarlane was shot and killed under controversial circumstances thought to be a ceasefire signal. In retaliation, the insurgents set the property ablaze, forcing Kirkpatrick to surrender. The incident led to several casualties, with McFarlane and one or two militiamen killed, and possibly a United States soldier as well. Although the United States soldiers were released, Kirkpatrick, Lennox and Presley Neville were initially taken captive, but later managed to escape. The precise number of casualties at Bower Hill remains uncertain, marking a grim chapter in this confrontation. On July 18, McFarlane was honoured with a funeral that many viewed as befitting a hero. His death significantly intensified the already growing tension in the rural areas, pushing many who were previously moderate in their views, like Brackenridge, to the limits of their ability to calm the public. The situation escalated with leaders such as David Bradford stepping up, actively promoting the idea of taking up arms in resistance. On July 26, acting on these sentiments, Bradford led a group in intercepting the U.S. mail as it was departing Pittsburgh. They were on the lookout for anyone within the city who might be against their cause and stumbled upon several letters criticizing the rebels. Subsequently, Bradford called for a military gathering at Braddock's Field, located roughly eight miles east of Pittsburgh. The call to arms was answered on August 1st by approximately 7,000 individuals, predominantly from the poorer segments of society who didn't own land or whiskey stills. The dissatisfaction with the whiskey excise tax had broadened into a more general disillusionment with other economic injustices. Wealthy landowners, many of whom were uninvolved with the whiskey trade, found themselves targets of violence. Among the radicals, there was a push to march on Pittsburgh, derisively referred to as Sodom, to loot the homes of the rich and burn the city. Some suggested attacking Fort Fayette. The revolutionary zeal of the French Revolution was praised, with discussions about importing the guillotine to America making rounds, and Bradford seemingly likening himself to Robespierre, a key figure in the French reign of terror. Talk at Braddock's Field veered into discussions of breaking away from the United States and possibly allying with Spain or Great Britain. A specially designed flag waving proudly declared their assertion of independence, each of its six stripes representing one of the counties present, Allegheny, Bedford, Fayette, Washington and Westmoreland from Pennsylvania, and Ohio County from Virginia. The threat looming over Pittsburgh was somewhat alleviated when the townspeople expelled three individuals whose letters had incensed the rebels. Additionally, a delegation from Pittsburgh expressed solidarity with those at Braddock's Field. Brackenridge managed to convince the crowd to limit their actions to a defiant but non-destructive march through Pittsburgh. The sole casualty of violence in Pittsburgh was Major Kirkpatrick's barns, which were set aflame. On August 14th, a significant gathering took place at Parkinson's Ferry, which you might know today as Whiskey Point, located in present-day Monongahela. This assembly brought together 226 individuals involved in what's known as the Whiskey Rebellion, coming from six different counties. The purpose? To discuss and consider various resolutions put forward by a group that included Brackenridge, Gallatin, David Bradford, and quite a character, Herman Husband. Husband wasn't just any delegate from Bedford County. He was a well-known figure in the area, famous for his radical advocacy for democracy. This wasn't his first participation in a movement, as he had been a part of the Regulator movement in North Carolina some 25 years earlier. At this gathering, known as the Parkinson's Ferry Convention, a committee was also formed. Their mission was to engage with peace commissioners sent by no one other than President Washington himself. In a pivotal moment, Gallatin stepped up to deliver a powerful speech advocating for peace and strongly opposing any suggestions from Bradford to continue the revolt. When President Washington faced what appeared to be an uprising in western Pennsylvania, he moved cautiously but firmly to maintain the authority of the government. He really did not want to disturb the public, so he sought counsel from his cabinet in writing on how to manage the situation. His team recommended the use of force, all except for Secretary of State Edmund Randolph, who was completely in favor of making peace. Washington decided to attempt both strategies. He dispatched negotiators to converse with the rebels while simultaneously beginning the assembly of a militia. Privately, Washington wasn't very optimistic about the negotiations succeeding, 
and felt that a military operation would be necessary to prevent any further disturbances. Some historians have considered that sending the peace commissioners was purely for show, and that Washington was determined to utilize force from the outset. Yet historians Stanley Elkins and Eric McKittrick have indicated that the military action was also a step towards reconciliation, as showing overwhelming strength might deter any additional rebellions. Meanwhile, Hamilton was engaged in composing essays under the pseudonym Tully in Philadelphia newspapers. He strongly condemned the violent protests in western Pennsylvania and advocated for a military solution. At this time, Democratic-Republican societies were emerging throughout the country, and Washington and Hamilton viewed these groups as a significant part of the problem behind the unrest. The historian Mark Spencer noted in 2003 that the exact impact of these societies on the Whiskey Rebellion is still a topic of debate among historians. But there appeared to be a notable overlap between the members of these societies and the rebels. Before Washington could mobilize the militia, the Militia Act of 1792 required a Supreme Court justice to declare that the local law enforcement was incapable of handling the situation. Justice James Wilson stepped forward on August 4, 1794, declaring that Western Pennsylvania was officially in a state of rebellion. Just a few days later, on August 7, Washington announced, with the deepest regret, that the militia would be deployed to suppress the rebellion. He ordered the insurgents in Western Pennsylvania to disband by September 1st. In the summer of 1794, President George Washington dispatched three officials from Pennsylvania to address a tense situation in the western part of the country. These officials were Attorney General William Bradford, Justice Jasper Yates of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and Senator James Ross. Their mission officially commenced on August 21st when they convened to discuss the matter with some local leaders, including notable figures such as Brackenridge and Gallatin. The directive from Washington's delegation was unambiguous. The local committee had to unanimously consent to cease all violent acts and adhere to U.S. laws. Furthermore, they insisted that the locals vote on this resolution to determine if the majority was in agreement. If the populace complied with these terms, they would not face subsequent legal repercussions. However, the committee found itself divided between advocates for radical change and those preferring a more moderate approach, barely managing to consent to the government's demands. When the vote took place on September 11th, the response was varied. Some communities were entirely in favor of abiding by U.S. laws, but in areas where the poorer and landless inhabitants resided, there remained staunch opposition to the government. By September 24th, the communication from Washington's envoy to him was straightforward. They deemed it vital to deploy the military to ensure the enforcement of the laws properly. On the very next day, Washington summoned militias from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia, emphasizing that assisting the rebels would entail serious consequences. Nevertheless, it appeared that most were inclined to follow the government's directive. In a final effort to avert military conflict, William Findlay and David Reddick, representatives of the Western locals, attempted to persuade Washington to retract his advancing army. Washington, along with Alexander Hamilton, declined, arguing that without a decisive demonstration of force, the likelihood of violence resurging remained. The governors of New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, under a new federal law, called up state militias, forming a large force of almost 13,000 men. This size was notable for the time, on a par with the armies commanded by Washington during the American Revolution. Not many were keen to join the militia voluntarily, leading to a draft. This draft, however, was met with widespread resistance, evasions, protests, and, in some places, riots particularly in eastern Virginia and Hagerstown, Maryland, where Governor Thomas Sim Lee had to send 800 men to suppress an uprising and around 150 people were arrested. As these militias were forming, liberty poles became symbols of resistance, causing concern among federal officials. For example, a liberty pole raised in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, on September 11, 1794, led to the arrest of suspected supporters later that month, during which two civilians were killed in separate incidents. President Washington, in a historic move, led the troops in the field, demonstrating his direct involvement in quelling the Whiskey Rebellion. His journey took him from Philadelphia, the capital at the time, to Reading, Pennsylvania, and further westward, with a notable stop in Bedford, Pennsylvania, to meet with Western representatives before reviewing the Army's southern wing in Fort Cumberland, Maryland. He then handed command to Virginia Governor Henry Light Horse Harry Lee and returned to Philadelphia, leaving Alexander Hamilton to advise the army. In the field, Daniel Morgan, a notable figure from the American Revolution, was promoted and tasked with leading one wing of the militia into western Pennsylvania.
his team's imposing presence effectively ended the protest without violence. Morgan would stay on with a portion of the army in Pennsylvania into 1795. Among his troops was Meriwether Lewis, who would later become famous for exploring the West. Colonel Jonathan Foreman, a veteran of the Revolutionary War, documented his regiment's role and an encounter with President Washington, expressing satisfaction at Washington's inquiry into one of the unfortunate incidents that had occurred, showing Washington's hands-on leadership during this crisis. In October 1794, the uprising in western Pennsylvania came to an end when the Federal Army made its way west. Key figures in the rebellion, like David Bradford, escaped further west to avoid capture. It took six months to bring those charged to trial, and most were cleared of charges due to issues like mistaken identity, unreliable witnesses, and a lack of solid evidence. Only two people were ultimately sentenced to death by hanging. Before arrests were made, up to 2,000 rebels had escaped to the mountains out of reach of the militia. This was a big letdown for Alexander Hamilton, who had hoped to capture and possibly execute rebel leaders like Bradford in Philadelphia. However, when the militia withdrew, they had only captured 20 people to make an example of, and these were merely minor participants in the rebellion. These captives arrived in Philadelphia on Christmas Day, welcomed by celebrations in the streets, though their parade down Broad Street was meant to shame them. Out of 24 men indicted for high treason, only 10 were tried because the rest evaded capture. Of those, Philip Weigel and John Mitchell were the only two found guilty of treason and sentenced to death, Weigel for attacking a tax collector and burning his house, and Mitchell for robbing the U.S. mail under Bradford's influence. Both men were eventually pardoned by President Washington. In trials held in Pennsylvania state courts, numerous convictions were handed down for assault and rioting. In his seventh State of the Union address, with the help of Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, Washington explained his decision to pardon Mitchell and Weigel, emphasizing his duty to use his powers firmly, but also to exercise moderation and compassion as far as the law and safety allowed. While the violent resistance to the whiskey tax ended, political opposition didn't. Critics of internal taxes rallied behind Thomas Jefferson, helping him win the presidency over John Adams in 1800. By 1802, Congress had done away with the whiskey tax and all other internal federal taxes. Until the War of 1812, the U.S. government would rely solely on import tariffs for its income, benefiting from the nation's growing trade. The way President Washington and his team handled the Whiskey Rebellion actually received a lot of support from people across the country. This demonstrated to everyone that the new government was not hesitant about intervening to stop individuals from violently opposing its laws. This was perceived as a significant victory for Washington's team, and most historians concur. However, it is noteworthy that despite this, they still faced challenges in enforcing the whiskey tax payment, particularly in the western areas where many individuals refused to pay the tax. Additionally, this situation accelerated the formation of political parties in the United States, a process that was already underway. When Thomas Jefferson and his Republican Party, who had disagreements with Hamilton and Washington's Federalist Party, assumed power in 1801, they abolished the whiskey tax. The rebellion also ignited a major debate regarding the acceptable forms of protest under the new constitution. Christian G. Fritz, a legal historian, highlights that there was a lack of consensus on who held authority in the United States, even after the constitution's adoption. The Federalists believed that the government was in control because it was established by the people. To them, Rebelling was permissible during the American Revolution, but not thereafter. Conversely, the Whiskey Rebels and their allies contended that they, as the people, were the true authorities owing to the Revolution, and that they possessed the right to resist the government, even through means not specified by the Constitution. Historian Stephen Boyd has remarked that the suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion caused individuals who were previously critical of the Federalists, especially those in the Western areas, to start supporting the Constitution they decided to pursue changes by voting for Republicans rather than opposing the government. The Federalists, for their part, began to recognize the public's role in governance and ceased opposing the people's right to assemble and demand reforms. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.